Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Madeline No, and I'm with NetHope. Today uh, we have a webinar for you and we'll be talking about machine learning in mapping and spatial analysis. Today we are very pleased to welcome three NetHope member organizations for our presentation today. Uh, first, 510, the data team from the Netherlands Red Cross humanitarian open street map team and Catholic Relief Services. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few of our housekeeping guidelines for the session today. We love it if you keep this an interactive session. Please open your Zoom chat window and post any of your comments or questions there for our Q&A and discussion. Um, also, we will be following up with an email that will include some um, a summary of today's session, as well as a link to the recording and some follow-up materials. So please look out for that later today or tomorrow. Also, we uh, very much appreciate your feedback. Please take a moment at the end of the session today to complete our webinar satisfaction survey. Your feedback is important to all of us and it helps us make this, this webinar series better. And with that, I would like to hand it over to our moderator for today's session. Bo Percival, Director of Technology Innovation from Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. Bo? Thanks very much, Madeline, and um, welcome to everyone. It's great to have you here. Uh, it's, yeah, knowing it's the end of the year, we really appreciate you joining us for this last um, NetHub webinar. Uh, I don't want to do too much talking because we've got such a great panelist today. So. What I'm going to do, um, as Madeline already said, I'm Director of Technology Innovation at Humanitarian Open Street Map Team. Um, I would welcome those that are joining. I just saw a few pop up uh, to, of everyone to introduce yourself as you join. Let us know where you're from and who you're affiliated with. And what I'm going to start by doing is just asking each of our uh, presenters or panelists for today to just introduce themselves. And then we'll be able to kick off the way that the webinar will go today is we're going to have short presentations for each of the presenters to talk about what uh, AI and satellite imagery use cases they've been working on. And then we're gonna have a little bit of a discussion. I've seen some messages pop up there from Seth. Please throw questions, comments, uh, anything you'd like in the chat that we can add into that discussion at the end. Uh, and we've got a few questions as well, uh, ready for each of the panelists too. So I'm gonna hand over to Jacopo to start with the introductions and then um, yeah, we can go from there. Go ahead, Jacopo. Hi, right, thanks, Bo. Hi, everyone. Very happy to be here and uh, welcome to this webinar. My name is uh, Jacopo. I'm a data scientist at the Netherlands Red Cross 510. That will be the data team of uh, the Netherlands Red Cross. Um, as a data scientist in the organization, I'm responsible for developing and implementing machine learning solutions in uh, whatever tools we use uh, during uh, emergency operations and more uh, standard humanitarian uh, operations of the Red Cross around the world. Back to you, Bob. Hello, everyone. Yeah, thanks. Uh, this is Omran. Omran, go ahead. Thank you, Bob. Uh, hello, everyone. This is Omran Najjar. I'm the AI and advanced data engineer with the Humanitarian Open Strategy Map Team. My background is software engineering and information systems. Uh, we're looking at thought uh, of how we can also integrate and make mapping for humanitarian purposes and different purposes uh, easier using those advanced technologies. And from there, uh, it's also uh, being having uh, the, the openness and the core values for how to integrate it in those technologies. Over to you. Hi, everyone. My name is Catherine Clifton. I'm the data analytics and reporting lead for Catholic Relief Services. Um, prior to this, my background is and I'm an agriculture scientist. So I really learned data through agriculture science, um, but it's exciting to be able to look at problems across the globe and in different sectors. Fantastic. Thanks, everybody, for the quick introductions. Um, Jacopo, if you can just throw up that first slide, that would be greatly appreciated. I'm going to spend about 30 seconds just providing some context for the uh, webinar today, and then I'm going to hand over to each of the uh, presenters. So actually, I just realized that we're talking about bigger than satellite imagery, but uh, many of the use cases that we discussed today are looking at AI mapping and spatial analysis, uh, particularly around satellite imagery and others. 
what I wanted to just kind of briefly touch on, and we're going to dive deeper into each of these use cases that the panelists have joined us for today, but just to get people to think about how, when they think of these two things like AI, satellite imagery, AI mapping, AI and spatial analysis, what you think about first. And, and it's often a really interesting question because when someone says like maps AI, there's a few use cases that people go to quite typically, but what I'm really interested in getting to today is like not just the first response, but looking at these other ways that we can use AI in this space. So feature prediction is one that's used quite often, taking one image, a satellite image, running a model over to see is there something here or something else. So when I say something, either a building or a road, um, the different kinds of land use. There's also uh, use cases around completeness and complexity. So understanding, um, how complete a map might be compared to what you can see in a satellite image. Uh, there's also one's uh, use cases around uh, predicting disaster impacts. So recognizing if a disaster is headed in this direction, what might happen. And then a really popular use case, which some people might know about is uh, predicting GDP from uh, street lights and satellite imagery. And this is used as well for population estimations and um, economic factors as well. So that's kind of the context in this, uh, dare I say, the space of which we're talking about today. Uh, and so what I'm going to do now is hand over to Jacopo to talk through their use case and a little bit about what they're doing with 510 and NRC. Thank you, Bill. Yes, I'm here to present you one uh, specific use case, which is automated damage assessment. Uh, and um, Hopefully, this will, uh, will be a nice example of what you just described, Bo. Um, we, so I am part of uh, 510, that's the data team of the Netherlands Red Cross. Two words about us. As a data team, our purpose is to improve speed, quality, and cost effectiveness of uh, humanitarian aid uh, by using data and uh, digital products. And hopefully, today, I'll give you a good example of what this means uh, concretely. So um, to walk you through the use case, let's start from, uh, um, let's start from, uh, let's say, the real, the, the very beginning. There is, for example, a big uh, uh, hurricane coming in, which has been forecasted and is coming in uh, um, very soon. When uh, the hurricane strikes, uh, this is what you usually see. It, uh, it uh, brings uh, lots of damage over vast areas and, uh, Humanitarian organizations and first uh, responders are, uh, are there to try to understand how we can best respond to such catastrophic event. Now, in the case of a disaster like a hurricane, the scale of the damage, so the area impacted by the hurricane itself can be very big. For instance, an entire island or even multiple islands. So immediately after the disaster happens, uh, humanitarian organizations are often left wondering, where do we go next? Uh, we see, for instance, from the satellite image that there, is, uh, there are damaged buildings pretty much scattered around the, the island. So how do we take a decision? Where do we start, uh, for instance, with relief uh, activities or uh, with evacuation, setting up uh, emergency shelter, things like that. So this is really, concretely speaking, the very first information needs of emergency responders are very often, where are the people in need? And how bad is the situation? So what is the scale of the damage? How many houses have been destroyed? How many uh, people are likely going to be displaced because their house is not uh, usable anymore? So how do we, how do we get this, this information at the moment? We do it in two ways, uh, either by going to the field and surveying, so collecting this information from the ground, uh, but that's often impossible, either because the roads are not usable, as you see in this picture, or sometimes because the area affected is so large that it takes weeks, weeks, if not months, to actually collect this information, all the information that you need. So another way to, to, to get this information is to use satellite imagery, which at the moment, there are several organizations providing uh, uh, these analysis of satellite images as a service. Um, um, and this, of course, has uh, some advantages in the sense that you can cover larger areas, and you don't have problem of accessibility because a satellite can often get the image anyway. Uh, of course, there are also cons, like the image is limited to what you can see, so that the damage that you can assess is only limited to what you see from the sky. And it can also be slow, right? Because that's a, 
a human uh, uh, annotating these images. So if the scale of the area, the scale of the disaster is large, again, it might be a little bit too slow. So there, this is the main issue that we, we solve with uh, automation. So we immediately need to know something, uh, but, uh, but the, the current methods with, with, with which we get this information are simply too slow. So how do we speed it up? As I just mentioned with automation. With automation, we start also by high resolution satellite images, uh, which in the case of disasters are often public available. For instance, the, the Maxar has the, an open data program on which they release high resolution satellite images pre and post disaster. And then we have AI models to analyze these images, which means if it's about a, a damage assessment to detect buildings and classify the damage on those buildings. The advantage of automating the procedure is that it's fast, it's accurate, or at least it's consistently accurate. You know that you can test the model and you know what to expect, um, and it's reproducible. So it is not linked to one analysis of one expert, which of course has his or her own ways of analyzing the images, but everyone can reproduce the results. So it is also, I would say, more scientifically uh, sound as an approach. Um, of course, it suffers from the same limitations of damage assessments based on satellite images, which is you only see the damage that you can see, you can only assess the damage that you can see from the sky. Depending on the type of disaster, this can or cannot be ideal, but uh, that's what we can do with satellite uh, imagery. So uh, concretely speaking, um, of course, we developed a solution uh, with which our users, uh, information managers of the, of the Red Cross and other organizations can access these damage assessments. So I'm not going into the details, but I just want to highlight the key features of our solution, which I think is really important also to, to share um, as a good practice, I would say. So first of all, uh, whatever we develop, we co-design with our end users to make sure that whoever is gonna use this information uh, can use it and finds it useful for their work. Um, so really important to think together to, with your users how, how to present the information. It is modular uh, in the sense that what the information that, so the, the damage assessment is only the very first information need but then when, you, when, when, when the operation goes on and on, other information becomes important. For instance, what is the relatively wealth of the various affected areas to, again, it might be relevant to decide on which area to prioritize. So uh, the, the one interesting solution is then to, that, that uh, our, one interesting feature of our solution is that you can overlay the information on damage with others, for instance, uh, this, this relative wealth index uh, uh, or other, other indicators of poverty or vulnerability in general that might be relevant for your assessment. Uh, of course, this approach also needs to be embedded in emergency response protocols because you want to make sure that if you provide this information, it is actionable. So you need to discuss again with your end users, how do you need this information and which actions are you gonna take when this information is provided to make sure that this enters into the decision-making processes of any given organization that you work with. Uh, of course, this is more a technical point, but also important. The solution uh, should be scalable. Uh, if you want to make sure that the running time, that the data processing is fixed, even with a very large disaster, you need to have a proper infrastructure. We use Azure, but you can use any other cloud solution. As long as your model is uh, dockerized, you can scale it up and you can uh, process many images, as many images as you want with a fixed uh, running time. Again, to make sure that you are solving the problem of speed, which was the main argument uh, in favor of moving towards automation. And finally, uh, we are proud to say that our solutions are all are fully open source, which we hope increases trust in uh, in in, uh, in in these kind of approaches and encourages adoption not only by us, but also by local organizations that might need this, to apply this tool in a context of which we are not aware. We might not be there to support them. So it's important that everyone is empowered with this kind of technology and knowledge. So since everything is open source, I really encourage you to go and uh, dig into our uh, GitHub uh, page uh, where you find everything that we develop. 
And in particular for damage assessment, we also published uh, a paper recently in which we, we explain in great detail the methodology, the model, uh, of course, these are neural networks. You find the architecture there, uh, the performance metrics, et cetera, et cetera. So all the details that I don't have time today to show you. I hope this was comprehensive enough. Uh, thank you for your attention. I would give uh, the word back to Bo. Yeah, Kobo, thanks so much for kicking us off. That was um, perfectly timed, first and foremost, and very succinct. So I think there'll be like hopefully a lot of questions that will come through from the group um, here. Uh, and so I'm going to hand over to Catherine next, and we'll hold all the questions till the end. Um, but thank you very much for that. And Catherine, are you able to uh, switch over the sharing now? Yes. So let me do that. Um... I, for some reason, now can't see it. So I knew this was gonna happen. Give me just a second, if you don't mind. Um, so let me go ahead and introduce myself while I figure out how to share my screen. Um, I'm Catherine Clifton uh, from Catherine Relief Services. And I am the Global Data and Analytics, Global Data, data Analytics and Reporting uh, Lead. Let's see, can you see my screen now? Yeah, we can. we can see, okay. yes, your right. calendar. Thank it you. looks very okay. Sorry, <laughs> my calendar looks great. Well, <laughs> thank you. My apologies. Uh, working on it's always funny to have these glitches as an IT person. So I'm located in IT division while well, I am originally an agriculture scientist. Um, I think there's a lot of potential in machine learning and more things that we could be doing um, that I'd like us to do, but I wanted to really focus my time on two concrete examples of how we are using machine learning or AI as well um, in our spatial analysis tickets that come in. So the way our team works is we support re su uh, requests across the globe, have a global team. Everyone's on nine to 13 support requests of uh, using advanced analytics. Some of them are spatial, some of them are non. Um, we just look at it as a form of data. So one is on rooftop counting. I think most of us in this room are familiar. I'm just gonna look at my watch to time myself, are familiar with this. Um, Maxar has provided this great uh, accessible data set of rooftop counting for Sub-Saharan Africa through the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, so if you don't have access to that, I highly suggest it. This has been wonderful for us um, because it allows us to do many things. One is to track households, uh, which ones have we gone to and which ones have we missed. So AI is actually what says this is a roof or this is a tree, or this is a field. And while Maxar provides that for Sub-Saharan Africa, um, we work in 100 countries. And so we work beyond Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, the image you're looking at here, we developed our own model to identify rooftops for, and this is for Madagascar, we can do it for any country program now. Um, that's pushed us into new, some new spaces, needing NVIDIA um, card processing capacity on the cloud. So it isn't something that we found just easy to run in the Esri space, that we've got to have some, you could do it in the Esri space, but you've got to have good computers. We've decided to move to the cloud rather than computers so that anybody in the agency could run it and you don't have to have a computer because we really want to build capacity. So why do rooftops matter? I think it's really important that when we talk about AI and the capacities and capacities we have, we're also really specific of how that's integrated in programming. So I'm one of these kind of um, people that have jumped from programming to technical to scientists to programming again. And so I've done a little bit of both and I really try to speak in a program language, but don't call me out. Um, what we do is this helps us is when we get onto the assessment and get onto the ground as well, say, okay, where are our clusters of most people? If they think about emergency, where do we need to be operating? Having rooftops helps us do that because we can start doing quick population estimates with average household size times the number of rooftops. We can start saying, all right, this is where our bulk people are. It also helps us, so let me go into that, sorry. It also helps us with WASH as well to say how many beneficiaries do we have in an area? And I'm gonna talk about that on each slide. Um, it also helps us then know which houses we've gone to, which houses we've missed, which we use a model. This is an input layer. So we use AI to make the layer and we use that as an input in one of our spatial models. So you're gonna hear a lot about this that you might think, oh, rooftops, well, that's done, right? Well, unfortunately, we found that it wasn't done enough for us. So again, we needed more area, not just Sub-Saharan Africa. And a lot of people would send me these cool links. Oh, look, Google has done it. And you can see what the results we got for Google. Oh, look, we have all these different um, you know, layers out there. That's great. The answer is 
what layer you're going to use is going to depend on your location. So in some places, in this one particular location that we're looking at, Google AI may be more accurate in some places, but it wasn't accurate enough for us in our area of interest. And so we decided to use our, our own model to help us get household locations. And we also decided to use Esri Living World Atlas. Obviously, if you're using better imagery like drones, you can do even better. But for most of us, um, Esri Living World Atlas, for most areas we looked at, was good enough. And again, if we don't have to run it, we'll pull Max our data. We love Max our data, it's great. Just we happen to need to run some models using AI when we get outside of the Bill and Melinda Gates layer that, that Max are produced. Um, for Sub-Saharan Africa. So it doesn't include islands, doesn't include the Northern part of Africa, Latin America, Asia, Middle East. So this is our model on household tracking. And so we did this um, for a malaria bed net program. Again, um, Maxar provided this data set in this case. So they use AI to say, this is a roof. And our model says, okay, which house has been visited and which house has been missed. And that enables us to better target for quicker follow-up to really make sure that we get complete distribution. And this is really important for illnesses and diseases that are communicable like malaria. And, and I would argue COVID, but again, we use this for malaria. Um, we're looking to deploy this in more programs to really make sure that we are following up. And it isn't a lack of CRS not doing our job. Let's be clear. We work for multiple partner organizations. And we've noticed that when we use these kinds of models, we start getting more accuracy. So a lot of times people say, oh, we're hitting these numbers. And then when we map it out, we're like, well, I don't know that we are. Let's improve the way we operate. Let's hit some, get some better numbers. So it provides us some more confidence. And then also we see in situations where we've got good reporting where we're maybe not hitting and we bring these models in and it helps us improve our, improve our, our, our programming. Um, so for wash programs, the, the real need was to say, we're putting in a well or hand washing facility and we need to know how many people that we're getting. If you've had a wash program, so water health and water sanitation and hygiene program, you know really well that you need to count direct and indirect beneficiaries. And this is a great way to do that. So we could say number of roofs, average people in a house, and this is the number of participants. Honestly, most programs are already going house to house. But what happens to get these kinds of numbers is that we miss houses. So this is often more accurate than even going to house to house. Doesn't mean we stop that because we need to be having conversations and monitoring, um, but it enables us to maybe move that to more random and, and then which is more feasible. Most programs don't have the budget or time to go to every single house, but then gives us better numbers in terms of how many people are in the community versus just kind of guesstimates from, from assessments that you talk to, with people you talk to. So that's another way we use it. A way we're looking to use it is for better service planning. So when we know clusters of houses, we can also say, here are our priority areas to deliver services, deliver wash facilities or any kind of service, whether it's a malaria bed net distribution, um, food distribution. Looking at these cluster houses helps us get us a, another input layer that we can put into lots of kinds of our models to help us improve decision-making. So we have models called multi-criteria assessment, we look at multiple different factors on where we should locate our services. And this is a very important rooftops, number of people in an area is a really good, a good way of doing it. Now, I know there's better population estimates that have come out of the play through Facebook and lights, but that has assumption that everybody has a light, right? And so here the assumption is that if you live somewhere, you have a rooftop. There's no perfect assumptions out there, I wanna be clear, but it's a more confident assumption for me than that people have lights. So I want to now talk about slow serve cluster analysis. Um, this is something I think that I just get really excited about it because while demographic trends or demographics are important, I think it's important to see where we're getting trends on the ground so that we can improve our operations. When we run machine learning, let's talk about what the way, let's define it a little bit and step back. So when I think about what machine learning is, you know, when I learned statistics, we got all these great models. And often, even in spatial analysis, we point our models at data. And what machine learning does, it says, okay, this is, we see the data, we look at the structure, and this is the model that we think is best. And it helps us to improve our confidence intervals so that when we look at what it's telling us, we can, we can have greater certainty that the trends we're seeing and the significance we're seeing is accurate. And so what we try to do when you think about why do we do machine learning, 
why are we doing all these things? What does my team do? What we really try to do is give people focus. We know that there's lots of data out there. I've been a, a manager for monitoring. And a lot of times you don't even get time to do this awesome analysis because you're just so busy collecting hundreds of indicators that you've got to report to that donor. We want to come back and tell people of all the indicators that you're looking at, here's the two or three most important things that we see in your data right now. Um, and it helps us reorient the conversation with our partners on the ground. Everybody's got priorities, everybody's got needs. But when we get that level of significance, you can start having a data-informed conversation with partners that enables diplomacy to say, yeah, I know what you're saying, I hear you, that's important, but the data is really telling me this and this is what we find to be significant. That's easier with statistical analysis and machine learning. It's a bit hard when you have summary statistics of hundreds of indicators. You know, they're all telling you something. How do you know which to go with? So that's where machine learning is really helpful and statistical analysis, machine learning is a way of doing it better. So this is actually not a traditional GIS, a traditional like remote sensing program, even though I'd love to have to present that to you today. I want to present this for a very good reason. I think that we all have good survey data in our programs. And when we run and we have with GPS points tagged, and when we run that through machine learning, it can give us spatial trends. We often only think about remote sensing. Let's go beyond that. And we can start seeing social clusters. So what have we found here? That sometimes we may have missed some people around some tendencies. So if you see park boundaries, highways, those were areas where we thought, okay, these populations are a bit more transient. We're missing them when we get out there. It's not because we're not doing our job. It's that when we get out there, they're not there. And so we've got to find out a way to operate differently with these transient populations. Now, this was a program in Benin, a similar program in another country gives me a different trend. So it's very interesting to see how people behave because even though we may implement the same kind of program, but ultimately people are different. So the social cluster analysis helps us adapt our program according to the way people behave or the way the social structure is in different localities. That's super important. People are, are, are not homogeneous, as we well know. So the other thing that was really interesting is these colors actually mean things. So these colors are telling us, is it a household of one? Is it a, is it a household? Is, is it a, a family with multiple family members? And we can do similar things. We've also done the same stuff for food insecurity. So we can start saying, are these, these colors mean, are they a cluster of people that's most food insecure? Um, or is it mid food insecure? Or, you know, so for, in the case of Madagascar, food insecurity may look like tubers with some fish. And in the case of uh, Malawi, it may be a little bit different. And these colors can actually tell me which of those groups they're in. So clustering is a really great way to use machine learning to look at some trends of people, like how these people behave and are, are composed differently by country. And then putting that on a map, we can also then see spatial clusters. And it gives us just so much more rich, richness. A, we need to follow up in these locations. And these are the kinds of people that need our assistance in these locations so we can tailor our interventions better. So I think I am at time. I need to stop. Um, and that is it for me. So we do this to help improve our programming. Thanks very much, Catherine. And we're going to come back to you. So that's not all the time that you've got for sure. Um, but actually, the thing that I really enjoyed for those that have joined any of the webinars earlier this year or the summit and the um, uh, AI working group, we've heard a lot. We've heard from Catherine about like how you do your stuff. So it's been really interesting today actually to see what you're doing because I don't think you and I get to chat about this all that much. So yeah, appreciate seeing like the specific programs and use cases. And there's some questions in the chat that please, everyone, I appreciate you sharing them. Um, I'm collecting them and we'll come to the questions after this. So Amran, I'm gonna hand over to you um, to take us through um, from HOT's perspective. Thank you, Paul. Um, again, I'm Amran Najjar, uh, the AI and Advanced Technology with HOT Tech team. Um, in order to take you through our journey in HOT of uh, how we, employ like and uh, use the AI and machine learning, I need to give a bit of background about what is OSM and what is the humanitarian OSM team is doing. Uh, starting from OSM, uh, OSM is a project that a free and open source project that has started around like 16 years ago. It aims to create and distribute geospatial data for the use of the community. It's a community um, project that is built by the community and the whole geo information data is contributed by the community and it's used by the community. 
humanitarian organizations are part of that community and they make the good use of, the, of it. In order to contribute to the map, and you can contribute, anyone can contribute, uh, just going to osm.org, uh, and then from there, they can contribute uh, by mapping and digitizing the, the map. Now, from there, there are multiple editors that, and tools that will help you in order to help digitizing that. Uh, one of them is the ID, which is the one in the illustrator. There is another, uh, this is a web-based uh, tool. There are other uh, desktop applications as well. Now, if we look at this map, you would feel, we would have a feeling that in this area, we have only this road and nothing else. While in reality, when we check the imageries, there are some people living there. And those are not representative, not represented in the map yet. But going back to how it looks like, they are not there. Now, in order to help those who are living there who might be uh, vulnerable, vulnerable for disasters, they are not counted. They're not on the map yet. How we can support them, and this is the, the community efforts being there. It's just by digitizing the area, digitizing that specific building. The most basic the digitizing and mapping technique is just to say that we have a building here and save those efforts, saying that those are in the map. In case of a disaster, they will be counted and then, then they will be uh, also included in any reporting techniques. Now, a humanitarian open street map team is a totally uh, another organization, a nonprofit organization, which vision a world where everyone is counted on the map. And that map data is accessible and used for supporting decisions in order to save lives and improve lives. Do from the audacious project within the five years uh, uh, period of that project, HOT is aiming to scale up to local communities in order to contribute to the map themselves. Those who are living there in those vulnerable areas, they can contribute to the map and help themselves. Our target and aim is to reach and to map an area uh, home for 1 billion people. 1 billion people in specific uh, 94 priority countries. Those are uh, identified based on the high risk uh, and uh, poverty uh, factors. Now, in order to do this, you need to be ready to map. If you're ready to map, let's go. Humanitarian Open Street Map will provide more tools. One basic tool and the most popular tool in, in HOT is Tasking Manager. It's just a project management tool that will help you organize a, a project in a specific area in order to do mapping in that specific area and digitize the map. So far, we don't have any AI or machine learning thoughts that we, we, we presented so far. But from there, seeing the whole world, it's a very big area. We need to map, we need to make sure everyone is counted. Creating a project, having and contributing through volunteers, through teams from humanitarian organizations from any organization who believe in open source and open source data can go and contribute there. Um, the, the tasking manager will just like um, make sure the efforts are divided and broken down into smaller pieces in order to go and map. Now, from there, nothing related to AI and ML. How we can make it easier in order to map and make sure everyone is, uh, is counted on the map. We have multiple uh, initiatives uh, contributed by different uh, organizations. One of them is the Rabbit. The AI editor, that is the one on the uh, browser, this is a fork from it, and it's like it has the same functionalities, but one more added feature. These added features is by providing a layer of AI produced features of buildings and roads, and those are coming from different organizations such as Microsoft uh, buildings and Facebook uh, global roads worldwide. It makes it easier because there are a prediction and rather than creating the whole road or identifying the whole building, it's just like selecting it to make it go and be merged into, into the OS OpenStreetMap team. Those will amplify the efforts of and connect communities in order to contribute and go toward the, the main target. So far, uh, Rabbit uh, is not integrated in the current version of Tasking Manager. It was integrated in the previous version. The current work in the progress for us is to integrate 
rapid on their task manager and make it easier uh, when projects are in, organized in order to use rabbit for making it faster and maintain the quality as well. Another project that has been running uh, uh, in cooperation with the, with the humanitarian open street map team as well is an ML, a machine learning damage assessment. This is somehow uh, similar to what uh, Jacobo mentioned earlier, like where we have the imagery if before uh, the, the disaster and after the disaster, and then we need to, shoot, to see and have an, uh, a damage assessment. Currently, it takes up to five days, depends on the area, in order to find those areas where we have the damage. Humanitarian OpenStreetMap team are uh, contributing with the training data in order to build that model, and then that model would be able to take the efforts from a couple of days to a couple of hours in order to identify those areas of effect. Another project that's we uh, in a work in progress as well is Testalized Imagery for Social Good. This is focusing on Kenya and Nigeria in collaboration with Microsoft and Maxar, where Maxar will be providing the satellite imagery. Microsoft will do the prediction model, and the humanitarian OpenStreetMap will propose like different techniques in order to take those into OSM and be ready for uh, usage by the community and the humanitarian uh, responder. A, all the techniques we mentioned earlier, they have like a closed source, closed models. The models are developed by big companies. A lot of efforts has been, uh, have been applied there. Uh, the models themselves, they are not open source. What we're looking at also, and this is a community project that the model will be created by the community and the results will be going back to the community. It's a collaboration with the German Aerospace Center in Germany, uh, where a master student is uh, getting from OSM and the open aerial imagery is uh, sort of maintained by HOT, and they will be creating that model and feeding that model back to the community. The, the, like, uh, the main component there and what's missing also from all um, AI and ML uh, projects that we have before is the feedback, having the feedback in order to improve the model themselves. Now, after the, the, the in previous projects, we have the, the predicted features and predicted building, predicting roads, roads, they are all open source, but the model itself is not. And then we cannot feed back in order to improve that model. What we're looking at doing now is getting those features after they are correct, uh, corrected, and then we'll be able to tell the, the model that there are some enhancements that can be done there, and then we'll be having a new version of that model. And it will be increasing its quality and maybe be, and be able to do better predictions. Yeah, that's all. those are all the techniques and use cases we have in HOT. And going back uh, to you, Bob. Thanks, Omran. Um, appreciate that. And great to see if, uh, some of the stuff that HOT's working on. Um, so yeah, I've seen some great questions come through and I appreciate all of those. I see that there's been some responses. So um, I'm gonna just start throwing some questions towards the panelists. Um, so everybody <laughs> be ready. Um, the first one, uh, Jacobo, is to you. It came from, and I'm sorry, I can't actually scroll back quick enough, but it was about the challenges that you face in building these models. So um, the question was like, what is the main or biggest challenge in building the models that you do? And how do you address those? Or if you've solved some, like how have you solved them in the past? Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, when uh, so the main challenge, especially when uh, passing from a prototype phase to a real product, like putting it into operations, um, the main uh, challenge that we faced were about ensuring a consistent uh, uh, quality of the images with which we, we do the damage assessment. Now, when you, what you find out there for you know, search for training data sets for building detection, rooftop detection, or damage assessment, you usually find a very nice curated data set with consistent uh, quality, um, which of course makes sense because you, you want uh, good data sets to, to train your models. But then in reality, you can get uh, literally anything. So satellite images can be of very different quality. And since the full procedure is automated, 
Um, you don't have someone manually checking those images and, and determining if they're good or not for uh, your model. Therefore, on top of your, um, of your um, uh, machine learning model, the one that does actually the task uh, um, that, uh, that, that you're interested in, you, uh, you also need a lot of uh, extra steps to ensure the quality of those images. So for instance, we have a model to detect the clouds to know if the cloud coverage in a given image another model to check alignment of images, like um, especially when you do damage assessment, you want to compare pre and post disaster. So you also make sure that those images are uh, decently aligned. So you also need to do something to ensure this happens. Um, so yeah, and this, this, this actually, in our experience has been quite, uh, let's say we did not plan to spend all those times fixing all those little things, uh, but then in practice, these are important to ensure consistent quality during uh, real operations, where you don't have time to do these checks manually. Back to you, Bob. Excellent. Thanks, Jacopo. Um, and actually, I appreciate you talking a little bit about imagery there, because um, Catherine, I'm going to put the next question to you. It was asked um, by Janet, there was a question there about like the availability of imagery. And given that Jacopo was just talking about imagery. Can you just talk us through a little bit about where you get your imagery from? Um, there, like how you deal with this like antiquity of it, how like old it is, how relevant it is, and how you kind of incorporate that into your process. Because for many of the NGOs probably on this call, like imagery can be a prohibitive factor. So I'm interested to know how you address that at Sierra's. Oh, I think it's prohibitive for everyone. I mean, I can, in the beginning, we, we were like, we're gonna choose one provider and then we really realized that that's just not possible because when we talk about imagery, I think it's important we start with the basics. We have visual resolution and spectral resolution, right? And so visual resolution is red, green, blue, what I can see with my eye. That's really important to have that very well in terms of feature extraction. This is a roof, this is a shape. When we think about just things we can see and then spectral resolution, which is what I really was trained on, is detecting things like an agriculture that we can't see. Lots of natural things where when light reflects off the surface, it gives me a different bandwidth. Now, depending on what the question we're trying to answer, we might want better spectral resolution. And depending on the question we're answering, we might want better visual resolution. Maxar has a wonderful visual resolution. And so that's great. But the problem what we face in many cases with Maxar, you get this great um, discount where I think it's like $22 per kilometer meter. I'm not sure, don't quote me on that, but it's something around that. And I know we needed to do a quick assessment around the Northern Lake, but if you got it, it was $100,000. And we just aren't gonna have that level of money. Um, so in those kinds of situations, it's tough because we actually can't um, give a quick damage assessment because we don't have the imagery available. There's a lot of talk about, hey, you know, through emergencies, there's, there's free imagery out there. That's where we've gotten a lot of our best imagery, sometimes coming from the UN or somebody flies a drone. Um, we do love drones. I'm going to be honest. Why do I love drones? I love drones because I can get data at the time and where I need below the clouds. So in the case of Maxar, one of the issues we had, again, was the satellites were above the clouds. There's a massive flooding event, flood, clouds, rain can't see through clouds. So we love drones for that reason. That being said, flying a drone over a massive area is not always realistic. I think drones work in certain contexts. So the great thing about drones is they've gone down to like anywhere between one to $3,000. And the cool thing, why did we get in the three? Um, you can now get, um, uh, you know, when, when you think about NDVI, which is crop greenness, so infrared, near infrared, which is great, not infrared, near infrared, and you can get red edge. So when you're talking about plant analysis, you want things that those things on your drone, and you can get a drone around 3000 for that. That's phenomenal. We love those. But let's be clear, you know, we got a full cost accounting. When we think about money, we only think about the cost of the drone. We're not thinking about hotels, um, getting to the, getting to the field, flying it, that has a cost. So there are, I think what I would say for rules of thumb that we've given people is drones are really good for small, quick areas when you need it now. Okay, great. We want to use satellite imageries over large areas when you're doing big assessments that are temporal over long periods of time. Um, those, those are great. So Landsat has come out with a new Landsat. I highly suggest for people that want better spectral resolution. So you want multiple bands. I think there's I have to forget if it's seven or 12, I gotta go back to my, back to, I go back to that, it's been, I'm rusty. Um, Landsat's great in terms of free imagery available with good spectral resolution. Where Landsat, and there's a new Landsat that just came out, 
the, where Landsat's not good is in visual. So that's where we end up on often Google, you know, think about how many people have been on Hot OSM or on Google or on Esri, you know, Bing Maps, all these great things that are great, but it doesn't always answer your question, right? So if you have a damage assessment right now and you need to know, Google is not going to tell you that. Um, that's where really working with your local UN chapter to find out if imagery is available. Um, we've reached out to Maxar frequently to see if they'll give us imagery. Now, Maxar has, just to be clear, something I've been really interested in us using. We just don't have the volume to justify the cost. I think, and I hope to see this trend occur with more spatial providers, I'm assuming it will, that they provide kind of this base package where it's like, all right, if you pay us X amount a year, um, you can get uh, it, unlimited imagery for us for Maxar. We're like, yeah, that's wonderful. It's still around the seven thousand mark, and we just haven't haven't been able to justify it. Um, and again, I think I have to I have to go back and look at what it is that they're offering. I'm sorry, I'm put on the spot here. It's not just their free stuff. You can already get stuff that they've already collected. I think it's um it's access to some 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 more imagery, and I think that that would be helpful for us because what is Max are charging when they charge that twenty two dollars? They're pointing their satellites right now to an area where they're not collecting right for for you know now. Um, but most nonprofits have access to their historical imagery. So that's, you can start using that. We use that a lot. So we use the historical stuff. We use the, um, their feature layer. So they do a lot of really good feature extraction on rooftops where they have it. We generate it where they don't. Um, Landsat's another one, Esri. So those are the ones right off the top of my head. I'm sure there's others and I could be corrected by remote sensors there in the audience, but those are the ones we use most frequently and drones. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that. I've got like a million like self promos for hot that I want to do around much of the stuff that you said, but I'm going to hold myself back. Um, so Amran, I'm going to throw it to you next with a question. Um, I saw a question come up about in about Google Maps and OSM. And I'm always hesitant to kind of like pit these two against each other. But what I would be interested in hearing a little bit from you in response to that question um, I can see the conversation happened in the chat, but I might get you to talk to it a little bit around why open data and open AI um, and open street map is particularly important to HOT and what HOT does as well. Yeah, thank you, Bo. Uh, focusing on the Google Maps, uh, they don't seem to be complete in those specific regions where they are vulnerable for uh, risks and disasters and in specific areas in Africa and in, uh, in South Asia and they. South America as well. So um, the map is not there. There is no Google card that's navigating there and like getting those data. Plus the data is not also uh, applicable and not accessible publicly and like reporting on them would be hard. This is where OSM and also hot values are like openness and transfer, transfer and inclusion. Um, we like same for AI. Uh, it's similar to data when we push like a protected features to the community and over push them into OSM, we have like uh, facing uh, somehow challenges uh, when people are uh, asking us and we want to hold held accountable for all those data which we're providing to OSM. Holding those uh, uh, data and be accountable means need to be open. We need to show how we created those features, how we <coughs> derived them, and how we will be also importing them into the map in order to be used by humanitarian and other also uh, organizations. Excellent. Thanks very much for that, Omran. Um, and Jacoba, I'm, I've uh, got another question for you, and then I'm going to kind of ask everyone a similar question. but. Um, Jacobo, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the uh, the feedback that you have in your models. So, uh, like, obviously, you're developing models, relative, like, from what I understand, quite quickly. Um, and you particularly highlighted a point about like co-creation or co-design with the users. So, once that model has been designed and you've started either using it, testing it, like beyond training it, how do you then bring feedback from those users back into the model to either improve it, update it, etc.? Thanks, Bo. Um, so I would make a distinction between the UX UI and the model itself. So in terms of, um, um, let's say, the web portal and the graphical interface that people use to access those information, those we follow um, 
I would say, standard practices of what is called the human-centered design. So after we develop such a solution, we would do, we go and do user tests uh, with uh, with our end users, and this would follow up for some time with them to yeah, to make sure that uh, usability is uh, is is ensured, and, and, and yeah, they're happy about the solution. But this is more about just interacting uh, with with uh, simply with a graphical presentation of the data. Now, in terms of uh, improving the model itself, so getting uh, the feedback of the users in terms of the quality of the model and the predictions, um, we are quite not there yet. So that's why I'm really happy that Hawk is working in this direction towards uh, inserting humans in the loop. And uh, so that um, practitioners such as my organizations, but also others can um, uh, improve the work that we do uh, through the help of uh, of mappers, they can assess the quality of food produced so that our predictions can, can help mappers uh, confirm the damage and vice versa, their, 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 their work can help improve the models. I'm actually discussing already, maybe uh, you, you, I guess uh, you guys didn't know, but I was talk I'm talking, I'm already in contact with, uh, with Tony and we're working together a lot and we're working together on this. So uh, following up very closely uh, this work because it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's how we move forward. In, uh, in this business. Excellent. Thanks, Yako. Uh, Yakobo. I appreciate that. And also noting, um, actually, a quick plug here that we did a um, bit of work earlier this year and last year with the Nesta Collective Experiment, um, a collective intelligence experiment as well, um, with some models that um, 510 had developed and then had to implement, like, essentially pretty quickly. So <laughs> that was um, some great collaborations there as well. Um, okay, Catherine, I have just a quick question to you uh, about, like you've worked on quite a few different use cases, I know, and presented some of them today. Which, like for next year, kind of what will be your focus around AI? Like, is there anything that you're seeing coming into, uh, sorry, AI for spatial analysis um, that you're, is coming into your radar or onto your radar um, and into scope for you for next year? And how will you be like scaling what you've already done or exploring new things? I'm just interested to hear a little bit about what you'll be looking into next year. Yeah, I think in terms for us to get awareness, scale and use, we need to be doing it more with the data we do have. So when you think about that survey data coming in, making sure we do more social clustering and really getting people to say, okay, this is where I need to go. This is what's going on. These are who my groups are. These are the trends I'm seeing in my data. That's where I really want people to be, I think is like a step one. That's like one step on a pathway of, of where I want us to be. You know, if you think about what I was trained on, which is remote sensing and agriculture, I'd love for us to do more of that. But I think that we really face, just like everybody I've worked for in this space, a lot of logistical barriers, and that's knowing where farmers are located and really demarcating their, their farmer boundaries. And if we can't do that, because it's so expensive to do that, to be very frank, you, know, you either have to have a workshop where people draw on, on images and that costs around $7,000, and that's even cheaper than going out and trying to find farmers in their fields who are often not there. And walking the boundaries, you know, without that, it makes it really hard for this information to provide meaning to people. You know, we, we've got cool stuff we can do in AI machine learning with spectral resolution. So we talk about, you know, what light bands are telling us, is your crop getting stressed? Are you having flooding? All these things we could do before AI and machine learning, but now we can do even better. I mean, that's the truth of the matter. And so that's what I'd love to see us do. But I, I really think we need to we need to think collectively of how how we do that better. I know so, some governments are now making a requirement for financial loans to say farmers have to register their boundaries. That might help us get there. Um, that's where I'd like to be in terms of long-term pathways, you know, really not just doing visual identification like this is a roof. We can already do a lot of that stuff. This is a well or this is all sorts of stuff that we can see from a bird's eye view down. I'd like us to pick up things we can't see and start telling people things that are, that are not there. Um, so that's, yeah, I think that's that's where I'd like us to be. Something that I want to mention that we don't do, but I think is really awesome. Um, there's a company called Fram out there, and I know that they are using AI and machine learning to really kind of get social data. They blast off these text messages. They use publicly available data, and then they give us really cool spatial demographic trends, like here's youth, here's pregnant women. That's so helpful because every program I've worked on is trying to say, we need to target these people. We have to don't know where they are, or we think we know where they are through quick assessments, but the data that they provide us is even better, and it provides a lot of value. That and put it in with our models, just 
really changes things in such a better way where we can really target. So I'd like to see more of that as well. Um, I could have presented some of that today. I just didn't because that's like, we didn't do it. But let's be clear, like some of the cool stuff that's happening in machine learning and AI, we don't have to do it. You know, I love it if my team can get max our data and we don't have to run AI, great. Like that's where we're gonna have more impact or if I can get pool data, social data from frame, we didn't have to do it. Or we're gonna use it for our decision-making fantastic and then i've got my team who can do it when we need to but um we are increasingly looking at vendors to be honest and i think that's that's great and that's on the pathway too excellent thanks very much for that and i i'm reading between the lines here but i'm hearing a call here for like more collaboration so correct me if i'm wrong but um between partners vendors stakeholders other ngos um which is fantastic um and okay, last question I'm going to land with you, Amran. Uh, a similar question to what I just asked Catherine. We heard a little bit about what Ecopo has been working, uh, is kind of like looking towards in the future, and then Catherine as well. So I'm going to ask you the same question. Um, what's on the horizon for 2022 for AI at Hot? Uh, thanks, Bo. Actually, it's a, a full workflow that's starting from uh, supporting the mappers. And until getting the feedback, as mentioned in the in the presentation, the feedback, uh, uh, the community feedback, in order to improve the model, is a missing piece so far in our work. This is what we're looking at in incorporating within the next year. Plus, that needs to be also supported by the community and produced by the community. Uh, currently, we have uh, the current researchers who is doing that. Uh, we have a, a round the deadline in mid next year, uh, 2020. And hopefully beyond that, we want to stop. We, like the model can always improve, considering all the challenges by training a model that will work fine in specific areas uh, in, in Asia, that won't work very well in, in different areas in Africa. If we're trying to build a model that's focusing on, on refugee camps, this is totally uh, different might be a different model, uh, model, AI model that will be working on a crowded cities or in, in urban areas and uh, urban and uh, urban areas. I forgot the other side of it. Rural, <laughs> that's the right Rural word. areas, yeah, <laughs> I stuck with it. Urban and rural areas, uh, the models will be different. Might reach a point where we'll before in getting that input into that, uh, the imagery is after getting the images and input to the model, we might need to do a clustering and a classification for that. And maybe we'll be having different models as well. So the best model that fits what, what's coming as from the imagery, that then will be making a decision which model we'll be having. Currently, we're working on the first one, um, basically the building detector. And hopefully from there, we'll have more improvement, more improvement on it. Um, mostly we'll be talking about it uh, in the next uh, next year uh, net hope uh, events. And Excellent. Then, well done. Thanks, Amran. And a good like quick plug there for what's happening for next year in NetHope as well. Um, so thanks very much for that. Um, I want to thank everyone, Yakobo, Amran, and Catherine for all of your um, input and your insight here as well. I'm going to hand back to Madeline just to wrap up. Um, but thanks everyone for attending, and it's been really great to. Uh, have you with us today. Thank you, Bo. Thank you to all of our speakers today and to the audience. Thank you for attending. It was a great session, very interactive. So we appreciate your, um, your input. Um, please do take a moment before you leave to uh, complete our webinar satisfaction survey. Your feedback is important and we want to hear from you. And don't forget, you'll receive a link to um, the recording for this session, as well as other, uh, other information that should be helpful to you uh, in an email later today or tomorrow. So look for that. And um, again, thank you for attending. Uh, we really appreciate it. Please have a great rest of your day and happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, Madeline.